leaves are pouring off the maple trees. Yes, and uh, as you see, um, we're going to record the meeting today for uh, hopeful, hopefully make it available for playback later. We're doing this in Zoom's meeting mode. So as you see, um, it's up to it's upon all of you to keep yourselves muted um, until until Q and A section session later. If you want to speak up, then and uh, we welcome you to keep your camera on so we can see who else is with us. But by no means is that required. So my name is Craig Kesnick. I work with. Sand County Foundation. We're a organization based in Wisconsin. Our mission is to support voluntary conservation action by managers and owners of working lands. So in the Midwest, that means we have projects that work with agriculture and farmers and focus on water quality improvement. And we have a fondness for projects that are locally led at a small watershed scale. Uh, one of our efforts to support that is what we call leadership for Midwestern watersheds. We've been gathering people together for the past 10 years for trying to build a community of practice among watershed professionals. We plan these events in partnership with the planning, planning partners whose logos you see here on the screen right now, um, and currently with financial support from the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, screen is supposed to advance here. There we go. Um, so I think several of you on right now have attended our meetings in person before. We've done, gosh, 13 of these so far across the Midwest in these places. We try to make them accessible by driving, not by flying. We have 40 or 50, 60 people at a time, plenty of time for networking and, and then learning from each other and, and, and learning about specific topics related to agriculture economics and social science and soil health and emerging uh, incentive programs in the Midwest and all kinds of topics. Um, we were virtual last year. We're doing this mini session today, but we're going to we're gonna um, be in person, we think, again in February on the 17th and 18th in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. So stay tuned. We'll send you more information um, about that soon. And really, the audience, um, as you know, in these meetings is, is a term we loosely describe as watershed coordinators. And those are folks sometimes employed by local county conservation or by state department, by a nonprofit organization, um, extension, sometimes uh, individuals or farmers who somehow find the time to lead watershed projects while they do their, their main job. Um, but by watershed coordinators, we mean folks who work in a defined geography, like a watershed smaller than a county or maybe up to a few counties in size. Um, and they focus on collaborating with conservation partners, with farmers, with industry, with local municipalities, and look for resources and pull together what they need to accelerate conservation adoption on the land and improve water quality. I do want to point out, we did a survey last year of watershed professionals in the Midwest. Every green dot you see is a response from the Midwest. We had over 100. Um, lots of good insight here on the profile of who are these watershed coordinators, um, what are professional backgrounds, what are further professional development needs, peer learning opportunities, um, things that help us keep these people in their jobs. Um, you can learn a lot, uh, go on our website and find out about, uh, uh, read the, the summary of this, of this survey. Um, here is our website and Lena will be posting it in the chat as well. Um, so go there to find the survey results. You can see some uh, PDFs of prior presentations at prior LMW meetings. You can sign up to be notified if you're not receiving them already, the emails about future events um, like the one coming up in Prairie du Chien. I will mention quickly a couple other um, things going on that uh, support uh, watershed coordinators and professionals, the North Central Region Water Network, um, a collection of university extension programs in the Mississippi River Basin. They have a whole list of activities. You can join our informal life hacks over lunch meetings. There's one later in November and one in December. Uh, pitch a problem and try to solve it and you know, discuss solutions with your peers, uh, fellow watershed coordinators across the Midwest. Uh, you'll see on the screen some other resources there. Um, you can go to that website, and again, Lena will post that one in the in the chat as well. And I also want to mention Fishers and Farmers Partnership. Many of you are aware of. Uh, they have uh, occasional funding opportunities, and um, you know, a podcast, and also opportunities to join online discussions among fellow watershed coordinators. And this is really a focus on farmer leadership and in watershed projects. Um, Okay, so back to our topic today, water and climate co-benefits. So 
Uh, most of us here, I think, in our jobs work on the primary purpose of, of improving water quality from land management. And we all know that many of the practices that we promote have co-benefits. Those co-benefits might involve reduction of flooding risk, uh, uh, creation of wildlife habitat, recreation opportunities. Um, there are also uh, advantages, co-benefits related to weather extremes and climate change. And those go in two directions. One for climate mitigation by literally drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and soil into soils and reducing emissions such as nitrous oxide with good nutrient management. And then also the climate uh, resilience and adaptation um, by improving the ability of the land to cope with variability in, in rainfall and drought and extreme rains and so forth. Um, so the next two hours we've, we've, we've separated into two sections. In the second hour, when you're going to hear from uh, Gene with American Farmland Trust, is going to focus on ecosystem service markets, especially carbon sequestration and water quality. And we all know that this is getting more and more uh, publicity as more programs come on board. And it's uh, kind of a, uh, takes a lot to understand all the, uh, you know, it's, it's evolving quickly. Um, ways that farmers can potentially get paid to do practices that have climate benefits, but also can have water quality benefits to support our existing efforts. That's, we're going to get to that in an hour. But in this first hour, we want to focus on what are some inherent benefits, even if nobody's paying any uh, per acre or per ton payments, um, what are inherent benefits to managing soil to capture water and uh, basically to, to weatherproof the farm as we're going to hear soon with, uh, with Jerry Hatfield. So Jerry, I welcome you to, to share your screen. Um, just so we know, we had over a hundred people registered. I see we have 80 in attendance. Um, when we do get to Q&A, I will want to let those who kind of fit that watershed coordinator uh, category kind of have first dibs at asking questions. Um, so when we get to that point, please, if you were someone when you registered and you had that question, what is the watershed project you're supporting? If you had an answer to that, that's kind of your, our primary audience and, and we want you to, ask, to, to make comments or ask questions first when we get to the Q&A in about 25 minutes or so. So let me introduce Jerry Hatfield. I think many of you know him already, but he is the retired director of the USDA Ag Research Service uh, National Lab for Ag and the Environment in Ames, Iowa. He's authored over 100, I'm sorry, over 500 publications. His work focuses on interactions among components of the uh, relationships between soil plants and the atmosphere um, and their linkage to improving air, water, and soil quality. I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, if Lena, you can post in the chat, there is a link also, as you see, it's already there, the speaker bios. Um, and you can read more, but uh, with that, I will hand it off to Jerry. Thanks, Craig, and thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, we're going to do a little deep dive uh, in 25 minutes, as much a deep dive as we can get uh, in, in this. And I entitled this uh, Coping with Uncertainty and How to Build a Resilient uh, Cropping System as part of this, because I think that really becomes a, a standard of, of what we want to think about and how we begin to look at this. Uh, and all of this, and, and I, so I started this out thinking about, you know, what are the causes of uncertainty relative to producers out there? And you've got, you've got weather, you've got soil variation, you've got input costs, you've got price of commodities. I hear the last two uh, in all of this. And so, but forget those. Uh, we're not going to talk about those today. Uh, those are have enough problems of their own. Uh, but I am going to concentrate on, on weather and soil variation and, and put you through uh, how all these things begin to tie together. How do we begin to look at what's going on with the weather, what happens in the soil, how do we begin to implement practices and strategies that uh, can overcome those. And I'm gonna give you some real life examples. Um, I see Wayne Fredericks is on the, on the call today. I saw his picture pop up. Uh, I'm going to take you some some of the data that uh, Wayne has shared with me and some of the, the fascinating pieces that we've gleaned out of that uh, and in terms of looking at this and, and the aspects of it. So with that, uh, we're just going to dive into this and, and 
talk about first what's changing in our weather. I mean, uh, you got all these different things. We've got variability in rainfall. We've got this changing seasonality of precipitation. We have changing temperatures. We have variability in temperatures as well. So you can ask yourself, what isn't changing in our weather? Um, we are in a period of our climate right now uh, that is pretty unsettled. And you hear all this talked about uh, with, you know, changes, uh, you know, what's there, what's the cause of it and things like this. But I'm going to take you through what we've seen in the Midwest. And uh, uh, because uh, Craig is in uh, Wisconsin, I just pulled out some of the Wisconsin data that we've uh, assembled as, as part of the Midwest Climate Hub, looking at all of these questions of, of really what's going on in our climate. And uh, this graph here is just the 30-year normals of, of precipitation, and the green line is the lower limit, uh, and the uh, red line is the upper limit. Uh, you can see that that dashed line in the middle, we've continued to increase the annual precipitation on 30-year normals over time, and, and we see that. Uh, we see that, and you'll see it across the whole Midwest, is that we're getting wetter, uh, and we are getting wetter in, in lots of different ways. Uh, we did a separation between spring and summer because uh, spring disrupts a lot of our planning practices and how we try to get crops established. Uh, and then we looked at summer because we really want that summer rainfall. You can see there's a slight negative trend in the summer. There's a, a little bit of a positive trend. This is not as dramatic in Wisconsin as it is in other states. Uh, for example, Iowa. There's a definite trend in, in spring precipitation going up, summer precipitation going down. Uh, so we're seeing that major shift, and we see that across the Midwest. The farther we move south and west, we see even more in all of this. So our seasonality is changing. And one of the pieces that we see in this across the Midwest is that our number of workable field days uh, in the spring has continued to decrease. Uh, so that period between the 1st of April and the middle of May, uh, when we looked at it in the 2018, 2014, 2018 National Climate Assessment, you know, we've, we've dropped about a week uh, of workable days out of that uh, six week period. So we're getting crunched in time to do things. So that's what this changing seasonality means for us in terms of the agricultural system. The other thing that's changing is that our temperatures and, you know, and this is kind of a, a mixed blessing in, in all of this. Uh, we, we talk about these rising temperatures, upper Midwest, uh, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, you know, really is not changing a whole lot. You look at those lines across there, we're actually the annual temperature or maximum temperatures actually been going down a little bit uh, over time. Uh, and you, you see this, uh, and you just contrast that to the minimum temperatures, the annual minimums actually been going up a little bit. And if you look at spring versus summer, uh, it's even more dramatic. So uh, summer minimum temperatures, so our, our temperatures are rising because, not because our maximums are changing so much, but our minimums are getting warmer. And so when you warm up the minimum temperature, you actually just begin to increase the average temperature overall. The minimum temperature increases have a lot of physiological implications. Uh, and, turn, and warm nights uh, tend to hasten uh, growth. They tend to, tend to hasten maturity in crops, and particularly when they're uh, occurring in the late summer uh, as well. So all of these shifting patterns that are out there are, are quite interesting in lots of different ways. And then here's the other piece of this is intensive precipitation. Uh, this is out of the climate summaries. Uh, that you can extract out of NOAA's database. The thing I want to point out is that since 1980 and onward, is that the number of observed uh, extreme events has continued to increase. And we see that across all of the Midwest right now. So our precipitation, uh, we're getting a little bit more of it. It's becoming in more intense storms. Uh, that has a lot of implications for runoff. Uh, how do we get that water absorbed back in the soil? all these different pieces that go with that. So, you know, you see that piece of the puzzle. I'm just gonna put a different slide up here and, and look at the changes. And this is uh, from 1986 to 2015, minus what occurred in the first part of the century. 
Uh, and so this is actual data. This isn't climate projections. This is actual data of just how much wetter uh, uh, the Midwest has gotten in terms of percentages. When you look at Wisconsin, the upper Midwest, we're talking about 10 to 15 percent wetter. Uh, precipitation, uh, that's occurred across the in, big increase has actually been across Texas and, and really kind of extending up the Ohio River Valley. You can see that spring precipitation change, uh, how much wetter it's gotten in the Midwest, North Dakota, South Dakota, and even the Pacific Northwest. Summer precipitation uh, up to that point was uh, in the upper Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota was actually trending about zero. Uh, fall precipitation is, was increasing. And so we're seeing these shifts uh, in precipitation patterns. But here's really what we project in changing the, by 2050 uh, in terms of some of the climate scenarios. Winter precipitation is expected to increase. Uh, spring precipitation is going to increase across the upper Midwest. Uh, the scarier part is that that summer graph, uh, that projected decline in summer precipitation. Uh, you see that that extends all the way up into Canada uh, when you think about those changes and then fall precipitation coming back. So you think about the implications of this for agriculture is that we really built Midwestern agricultural systems on reliable summer rainfall. And our rainfall has become less reliable. It's become more erratic. Uh, you look at the, the, upper, the upper Midwest, uh, particularly across the Iowa this summer, uh, major parts that, that were considered drought uh, and all of this, uh, you know, and then we got six inches of rain in, in October at the end of the growing season that, that basically messed up harvest, uh, you know, but didn't do anything for productivity. So you see these shifts in this, all of this, so what that's indicating is that we really need to start paying attention to the variability of the weather that's occurring, but then how do we relate that to how we manage our soils to capture as much water as possible? Because here's typical scenes of Midwest spring. I mean, we all see erosion uh, in all of this. We're seeing runoff coming off of fields. And, and these are just some pictures uh, across the, the upper Midwest. Uh, in all of this, and, and there's a lot of erosion that's going on because we don't have that soil protected. Uh, we, um, we end up eroding a lot of fertilizers and a lot of soils uh, off of that landscape at that point. So, you know, this should begin to concern people uh, in terms of how do we look at this system. The other piece of this is that uh, our current corn and soybean systems that dominate the Midwest uh, are continuing to lose carbon. And we've measured the fact that uh, our typical corn soybean system under a conventional tillage is losing about a thousand pounds of carbon per acre per year. If you think that uh, that soil organic matter holds eight times as much water as it does uh, carbon in there, that's 8,000 pounds of water that's lost every year that we can't hold anymore. So if you farm 40 years, you've lost 20 tons of carbon. I think what's even scarier is that it's what we consider as proper management is slowly degrading our soils. Uh, they're making them more vulnerable to inputs. We've lost the ability to infiltrate, uh, make that water available, all those different pieces that go with that. So we're seeing those pieces occur uh, within our system. If you look at it from this perspective and all of this is that that graph on the left, that low biological activity, uh, is if we have uh, low biological activity, we might have evidence of aggregates, but they're very unstable. So raindrops hit them, uh, they begin to dissolve into sand, silt, and clay. The silt moves down through there, plugs up the pores. Uh, we end up with slow infiltration, fast time to runoff. Uh, last weekend, I drove from uh, Iowa to Indiana uh, and crossed the uh, Eastern Iowa, there was already lots of runoff occurring in those fields uh, and everything. And those were slow, gentle rains. These weren't uh, two inch per hour rains. These, these were two inches over almost 36 hours. So it wasn't an intense rain. We see all this runoff already occurring. If you get soils that have high biological activity, very stable aggregates, uh, those uh, aggregates uh, are really 
very resilient to a lot of degradation. So we, uh, they maintain their shape, they maintain the pore space going down through there. We get very fast infiltration. Uh, so you look at this, uh, you find out that on that low biological activity, that soil that's been degraded, a lot of times across the Midwest, our rainfall infiltration rates are less or around one half inch per hour. <laughs> Uh, you think about this, a lot of times we get storms that, that are way in excess of a half inch per hour. Uh, and so if we can only take in a half inch per hour, the rest of it is lost as runoff and it moves soil out of that. Now you get in these other high biological activities. Uh, talking to Rick Clark the other day in Indiana, uh, he had run some infiltrometer tests. His infiltration rates were in excess of 12 inches per hour uh, on his soil. So this has been a long-term change in that uh, system. Uh, he can absorb lots of different water and we see that uh, in these systems as well. So our biggest issue going forward with climate is going to be how do we manage our water system? How do we manage water relative to agriculture? So if you think about this from a different perspective, here's our major limitations to yield. And I just kind of put it in the size of the box relative to where the implications are at. Water is our major limitation to yield across the Midwest. We've got temperature, we've got solar radiation, you got pests and diseases, got all those other pieces, but they're minor, relatively minor compared to what the water is. So if we want to improve productivity, we really have got to figure out how we manage water as part of that system as we go along. And we know this, I mean, uh, Lauren's in his combine today, uh, you know, and, and he's seeing this as he goes across fields that uh, we have variations in water holding capacity. We have variations in yields that are across these fields. Uh, yield maps are really related to water availability to that, that field. Uh, and you see this when, I, when we talk about some of Wayne's data uh, as we go along. So you see all these different pieces coming on. Uh, we can look at yield maps from, and we'll see that from a different perspective. But one of the, the aspects of this that I think is important uh, is to go back to, and I'm just going to bring out some data that uh, uh, Bruno Basso and his colleagues uh, uh, from Michigan State University have been working on, is looking at what are the different zones within fields? Uh, and they're finding out, and, and we've seen this across our data as well, is that there's really about three zones within a field. Um, there's areas of the field that are always have stable high yields. There are areas of the field that have stable low yields, and there's the unstable zone. So no matter what happens on the weather, that part of the stable high is always gonna be the highest yielding part of the field. The stable low is no matter what happens, it's always the lowest yielding part of the field. And the unstable zone is really dependent upon what the weather is during that growing season. And you look at all this, we begin to see these different dynamics. But I think here's really what becomes important in all of this. And, and thinking about what causes these unstable zones and the low yield zones is that a lot of this is related to water deficits and a lot of it's related to excess water. Uh, and we get these excessive uh, spring rainfalls. We have a lot of excess water at the bottom of this. The water deficit is occurring on side slopes. This is just a cartoon of a system out there. And you think about how large these areas are uh, in all of this. You look at the field average, those that have been pr prone to excess water when, uh, when seasonal rainfall is low, then tends to be high yielding. But if it's high, it, it tends to be drowned out spots or real pieces of that. Uh, the water deficits, the more it rains, the, the better off those are. And so you see that unstable zone go back and forth across the, all these different parts of the field. And so we're finding that this is affecting a lot of the land area across the Midwest. And the question is, how do we begin to look at this uh, from a different perspective? Over time, I've, I've begun to look at it from this perspective, and that is that it's uh, a term that we call genetics by environment by management. Uh, genetics is, uh, you think about it this way, uh, you've got management in terms of what we do, you've got soil as an environment, you've got weather as an environment, and then you've got genetics as the crop that we're putting into this. But if you think about it this way, uh, genetics really kind of represents the potential. 
uh, what do we got for a variety of breed or even an animal. Uh, stress is really what can't be controlled. Management is what we can control. I always tell producers that management is what they oversee. Environment is what they're trying to overcome. Genetics is what they're trying to optimize. Uh, and so you look at this perspective, uh, you really begin to look at it and say, we have a framework now of how we can begin to look at this uh, and begin to say, you know, what's positive, what's negative in a lot of this uh, as we go forward. And if you look at this just from a simple perspective of, uh, of carbon into the soil, uh, going back to the data that uh, Bernard Hudson pulled out the, the, of the soil uh, survey databases, uh, this is organic matter uh, relative to water holding capacity. Uh, that permanent wilting point, uh, you know, a lot of variation across that, but that doesn't change a whole lot as we change organic matter. What does change is that upper limit, that upper curve that's out there. So if we double organic matter uh, or we increase organic matter from one to four and a half percent, we've uh, increased or doubled our available water holding capacity. Uh, so you see all these different pieces. So that blue area in between those two lines gets bigger and bigger because uh, organic matter is really that sponge within the soil that's holding the water. So increasing organic matter pays dividends uh, in all of this. And so you can, if we decrease it, we're going to change it. Then if we increase it, we're going to change it. I'm going to slip over to some of Wayne's data uh, now uh, in all of this because it's a very fascinating study uh, in all of this. Uh, Wayne and I typically give a one hour tag team presentation uh, on his data and everything else that goes into detail. Uh, but uh, that red star represents where Wayne is at, uh, you know, just south of the Minnesota border. Uh, so he's in very northern Iowa. Uh, he switched over to no-till beans in 1992 because weather again was a factor and prevented him from getting any tillage done in his field. So he's, he just switched over in that spring to, to change the no-till. And as he said, he's never looked back. Uh, that success with no-till soybeans uh, put him into a, a frame to go to strip-till uh, corn in 2002. Uh, you know, so this has been going on, but what, uh, what Wayne gave us was all of his yield monitor data from 2003 through 2018 uh, to look at across 10 fields that he, that he has as part of his system out there. So we did a deep dive uh, in those looking at this, just to put it back into a different perspective for you. Uh, this is uh, uh, the soil organic matter maps uh, taken across three different fields. Uh, and you look at the uh, lines that they've continued to uh, increase in there. So there's been a two and a half percent increase over 25 years. That red arrow, arrow is that interval between the time in which uh, there was conventional and then it switched over to a strip till no till system. See, it's continued to climb. Uh, you know, that the fence rows represent six to nine and a half percent. So that could be the upper potential that we're talking about. So we're we're seeing this continued increase in all of these systems. Uh, and this was before even cover crops would begin to enter into this. The fascinating piece is what does this really mean in terms of looking at productivity, looking at resilience, all these other factors that are, that are there. Uh, one of the things that we looked at very, very closely was what was going on within a soil type, within a field, as the yields changed over time, or as, as the uh, systems begin to change. You look at that 2004 corn versus the 2018 corn, you see that what we did is we took all those low yielding parts of that uh, field, that soil type out. Uh, we tightened that distribution around the mean, uh, so the skewness and kurtosis begin to change. I always tell people that those are the two statistical moments that we really never pay any attention to, we always think about the mean and the median, but these actually, for this type of analysis, get a lot of insight into what's going on because we're seeing that that low yielding parts within each soil and now across the whole field, those fields are becoming more uniform. Uh, they're becoming more uniform. In fact, uh, as uh, Wayne finished at the 2021 harvest, uh, he called me one day and said, you know, 
those fields that where we were seeing sandy spots uh, within the fields, uh, we always have low yields because they're sand. We, he said he couldn't even find them this year uh, in all of this. So I think that's beginning to show that we are changing that organic matter. The question is, and that's what everybody asks is, so what's this mean? If we think about this, what we've really seen is that we have increased yield stability among the years. We have less variation uh, among the years. The standard deviations are about half what they are in conventional tillage. I think the more fascinating piece is that we've increased the water use efficiency. If we, we just went back and looked how much grain was being produced per unit of uh, rainfall during the season. Uh, we've had increases in the corn of, of nearly 50%. Uh, so we're making more efficient use of every drop of water that falls because we put it into that soil, we make it available to that plant, we get it back out. The other piece of this relative to the climate is that in looking at Wayne's date over time is we've broken the correlation between April and May rainfall and low yields because we looked across Mitchell County, we looked across the Midwest, is that the more it rains in April and May, the lower the average county yields. And the more it rains in July and August, the higher it, uh, average county yields we have. Just makes sense is that when we got that excessive spring rainfall, uh, we end up with a lot of delayed planting. We end up with that excessive water drowning out spots or causing problems in terms of vigor. Uh, the more it rains in July and August is that uh, we can take advantage of those soils that have low organic matter. We give them water so we get those productivity out. So those unstable zones become high yielding in, in that type of situation. So we see that effect going on. So we're seeing positive impacts, creating resilience, uh, creating a lot of this. So here's the opportunities that we have. Um, we do have lots of opportunities to change our management systems that increase water storage that directly translates into production. Uh, the more water we can put into that, the more we can make it available to transpiration, uh, we begin to uh, increase our productivity. Once we begin to increase productivity, we increase the resilience in cropping systems. Uh, as we look across the, the, the Midwest where we've uh, increased our organic matter uh, is that we're putting the water in there. We see that less variation among the years. And we see less runoff going off in terms of that, that uh, either from a sediment point of view or from anything that we uh, move off that landscape so we can improve water quality. We change that whole dynamic in this system. So we see all these different pieces happening simultaneously. You know, this has occurred over periods of time, but we see these changes going on uh, within these systems. So uh, with that, uh, Craig, uh, I know we've got uh, three producers that are either going to uh, <laughs> uh, reinforce what I've said or basically argue with what I've said, but uh, you know, we'll have a good discussion about this. So, and here's my contact information for you um, and, and everything. So there's my Gmail address. That the phone number is my cell phone. Just don't try to sell me life insurance or extended warranties on my car and I'll talk to you. So uh, we can go from there. So Craig, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Jerry. Uh, that was great. And as Jerry mentioned, yes, we're gonna have our three farmers here chime in pretty soon. Um, but first I just wanna welcome folks. If you have questions for Jerry, we can you can type them in the chat. Um, likewise, you can just raise your hand using the reactions thing. If you look on your lower ribbon to the right, there's the little reactions icon. You can do a, um, you can raise your hand through that. So first, um, I just want to give people a chance to chime in. Do you have questions uh, or anything you want to you want to ask directly of Jerry? Jerry, oh, there's one right there. Or at least it's a it's a thank you. So um, I guess Jerry, just in terms of um, you know watershed projects in Iowa, you got the water quality initiative, you got water management authorities, and so forth. Um, you know, are you are you getting opportunities to speak uh, in the context of that of that watershed project? Like, what does it take to move the needle in terms of water quality um, in a particular watershed, and how could management practices, if adopted at a certain scale, in, in not for the whole Mississippi River Basin, but just for <laughs> smaller geography, like are, are we getting closer to 
achieving some measurable in changes in water quality through these through these practices. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm always in it, a, a, the eternal optimist, so I, I figure that we are making some changes. But uh, you know, when we've looked at um, uh, the, the these dynamics, and and we we did a lot of, and well, we still the lab still does a lot of very intensive work. And uh, in the Walnut Creek watershed uh, that's just south of Ames, we do it in the uh, 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 basin of uh, the Iowa River as well near Iowa Falls. So, you know, we've been monitoring water quality for a long time. We can change those. We've seen it even more as we've taken one system uh, that's in the Iowa River uh, watershed and we've converted it from conventional to, uh, to a no-till cover crop system is that we've seen a dramatic change within three years uh, of that in terms of runoff within that landscape, the water quality is coming out. Uh, we're seeing a lot of different uh, uh, cycling going on uh, within that. So, you know, and a lot of this, uh, and we, when we begin to look at, at these uh, fields where you think about that, that part of the field where we've got that, that water deficit, is that we're applying the same amount of nitrogen <laughs> in that uh, area of the field as we're applying the other. And the unfortunate part is that those uh, low water holding capacity of soils, you know, don't produce that grain. Uh, and so there's a lot of residual nitrogen. They're also the first parts of the field that begin to drain early in the spring. So when you get in these drain systems, it's where we're picking up a lot of our nitrogen. So I think we can do a lot. And, and we've seen that even when we've made some changes that we can improve water quality out of tile drain systems within two years uh, by, by how we manage our nitrogen as part of the system, understanding its relationship to water. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think what we've got to get back uh, to is uh, data like Wayne's uh, showing that, yes, we can improve this system and we can adopt these systems even in this my frustration point is that these cold, wet soils of the Midwest that we can't do reduced tillage on. Uh, we can do that, uh, you know, in terms of even all, all these different pieces. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us. I think producers need to realize really what's changing within their fields. Uh, how's all this fitting together in terms of how we're managing uh, the, the tillage practices and how we're managing crop residue and cover crops, all those pieces together. And so, you know, we're seeing that needle <laughs> begin to move, but I'm not sure that it's moving quickly enough to uh, get us to the point that we want to be. Mm -hmm. okay. And I was trying to raise hand, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, let me just jump in. There's one that came in early on the chat. So how do you present this information to farmers who may not, may or may not receive the climate change language very well? Uh, it's, yeah, I, I've had the, uh, 15 years of experience is explaining climate climate change to people who, who uh, uh, wanted to always argue about whether it was human induced or natural cycles. Uh, but just go back and show them how much weather, the variability of weather, this changing seasonality and all this. Uh, and, and basically that you can't argue about the, the, uh, the signal. You might argue about the cause of the signal, but the more important for, the, for producers is how are you going to manage this variability, uh, no matter what's causing it? And that's the message that I try to get across to producers, is that water becomes your major commodity as an input that you need to be putting into this. And so understand how to manage your systems to be able to, to capture that one natural resource. Same thing we talk about for capturing sunlight uh, as well as to capture that water. And so it takes on an entirely different discussion when you approach it from that standpoint as well. Uh, the, uh, the, we always talk about climate deniers and climate acceptors and things like this. Well, let's, let's move away from that and let's talk about what's good for agriculture and what's good for your farming operation. Great. Uh, Todd Peterson has had his hand up, so I'm gonna let him chime in here. Hey, Jerry, um, you, in your, your uh, data on intensity of precipitation, um, I've seen several ways of categorizing what is an intense event. What definition do you use? Oh, the, it depends on what state we're in because it, it does fluctuate. That, what, that graph from Minnesota, or Wisconsin 
is more than two hours, uh, two inches per day uh, was an intense event. There's some states, obviously, that that intense rainfall goes down to about an inch and a half. So you got to look at, and, and so there's no consistent no. value on, on every, it's a matter of uh, kind of what the soils will absorb, uh, the climatology and all that. So Wisconsin is two inches per day, which, you know, you think about that, that's not a very intense rainfall event uh, compared to some of the things we see, but you know, it's real. So I think in Iowa here, it, they've used four inches in a 24 hour period. Right, yeah, I was one of our bigger ones. <laughs> and the number of intense in rainfall events per year is going up to more than 11 somewhere in the state per year. Yep, yeah, I didn't show the, I, I wanted to be very, I wanted to give Craig something to worry about for Wisconsin uh, <laughs> and all of this. So I didn't show the Iowa data. <laughs> Um, okay, just uh, now back to the chat for a second, Jerry. A, a question about how can you how can you help a farmer to to cost effectively measure this gap that they may have in their water holding capacity or infiltration, and then understand its its ramifications on productivity and profitability. Yeah, I get that. I get that question a lot uh, in all of this, and so uh, and I'll, I'll kind of flip it around because everybody wants to know uh, how you measure soil health. Uh, and all of this. And I, I tell producers that if you want to know if you have soil health, go out in your field and look after a two inch heavy rain and, and look at what the surface looks like. Uh, and if, because if you can't absorb two inches of rain into your soil and you see these little runoff pieces out there, you probably don't have soil health. And so when you really begin to think about this from this gap of water holding capacity infiltration, is is now working with them in terms of yield monitor data uh, and you know wayne's we analyzed 18 years uh, across that uh, and then we've added 19 20 and 21 to that data set as well but uh, i think getting farmers to realize what's going on with their yield monitor data i go back to this analysis that that bruno has done in terms of looking at high yielding stable zones and low yielding stable zones and the unstable zones is getting them to look at more than one year of yield monitor data and say, here's the whole sequence over a five year period. What does that look like? Uh, and then they can begin to see that here's where the productivity is coming from. Here's where the profitability is coming from. And here's how my soil is changing over time. So it's a matter of, of uh, dialogue. And so I have a, a concept that I've been working on <laughs> that is basically to say, you know, let's get let's get agronomists to think more about how we help producers transform uh, their systems, uh, transform their systems to, from where they're at uh, to where they could be uh, in terms of improving organic matter, improving yield stability, looking at the causes of all this, and then looking at profitability as well. So uh, I think a lot of that really is, is a matter of having a, a very structured dialogue with them but it's not about selling a product, it's about selling a concept and saying what's there. And I think it'll, it'll kind of go hand in hand with what Gene's gonna talk about with carbon. What's the real value of carbon? And the real value of carbon, if you go back and you look at Wayne's data, the real value of carbon is improving uh, that soil within that field to reduce that low yielding spot, making more advantage of, of the inputs that are going on there because Low yields, even though you're putting on that all those inputs, is a, is really causing you a profitability. It's causing negative profitability. You're causing uh, economic loss across that. So I think we really need to look at this from an entirely different perspective than the way we've been looking at. It. So that's that's my mission after retirement is to basically uh, spend most of my time trying to get this message out. So. All right, and uh, speaking of Wayne Fredericks, he has his hand up, and uh, he probably deserves to be <laughs> equally with the other farmers on the on the, the panel discussion here. So, Wayne, let's please speak up. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Jerry and his team at USDA for for the analysis, because uh, uh, until they went through that information, I could only surmise something was happening. Uh, they verified it. I think in Jerry's message, there was one key point that stood out to me that really caught my eye. And it's one that I often try to relay is that, uh, you know, we've lost a week 
maybe 10 days, two weeks of, of field time in the spring uh, because of increased uh, moisture. We're seeing wetter falls. So uh, we're seeing uh, more harvest difficulties that are you know, very difficult on, on our soils. And then we've got our dry summers. And I think the main message is we can't farm the same way we used to. We have to find systems to adopt to this changing weather. And it is something more than just going out and buying bigger equipment or buying tracks to put on your machinery. It is about building that soil structure. And so that's, I think that's the key message is that in this period of changing climate, uh, we need to take advantage of, of the opportunities that soil health, cover crops, and that can all bring to the picture. Uh, and that doesn't cost us an arm and a leg in machinery and equipment. In fact, it actually reduces our machinery and equipment costs. So, but that was, that was a key point that really stood out. We got wetter springs, we got wetter falls, and we're drier in the summer. We got to do something different to farm that climate. All right. Well, I want to uh, I want to get our other farmer uh, guests here an opportunity to talk. So we're gonna we're gonna you know kind of speak in the context of of what Jerry and Wayne have talked about so far before we move into uh, carbon ecosystem markets and so forth. Um, we have three farmers here. I'm going to give super quick introductions, um, and then just let each of one of them expound upon the message and give their give their inputs, and we'll take some questions too. Um, but each of these farmers um, we've invited because we. They're familiar with, with Jerry's message. Um, they're applying these very same practices that we're trying to expand on the landscape. And they're all leaders in their own way involved in, in networks, watershed and otherwise with, with, with fellow farmers and expand, helping share what they're learning and, and helping with peer engagement among farmers. So um, I'll just, I'm gonna introduce all three of them real quick here. We have Tony Pyrrhic. Uh, he's a, he, uh, with TNR Dairy with his brother in near Watertown, Wisconsin, just uh, up the highway from me. Uh, he's also the president of the Dodge County Farmers for Healthy Soil and Healthy Water. That's a producer-led group. We have many in, in Wisconsin, but theirs is one of the, one of, one of the uh, most active um, and successful of those. Um, separately, we have War uh, Lauren Steinlage. Um, owner and operator of Flolo Farm near West Union, Iowa, joining us from the cab of his combine right now. Um, and I know, Lauren, you're very engaged, especially with uh, in social media and such, with sharing your messages with other farmers and, and informal meetings and so forth. And we also have Seth Watkins, uh, Pinhook Farm near Clarinda in southwest Iowa. Um, and Seth, I've met before and um, very impressed with his operation and he's on the boards of the uh, Natural Heritage Foundation of Iowa and the Golden Hills RCND, and also Iowa Learning Farms. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know, Tony. Do you want to go ahead? Do you want to go ahead first? Sure, sure, I can. Like I say, Andrews, I'm Tony Parrick from uh, Watertown, Wisconsin. Here, I got started. Uh, my farm with my brother. We're cash grain, uh, dairy. And we do Wago beef and we have that, but uh, mainly our group got started uh, about five, six years ago. They had uh, lake associations were basically uh, pointing fingers at farmers for their polluted lakes. And uh, that got started. It was a big riff for a while. And uh, I was involved with that. And I saw the group starting up in uh, Dodge in Wisconsin, the soil health groups. And I got one started in our county. And since then, we broke a lot of barriers. We've got them understanding what farmers can do. They're putting money out for farmers to put covers around the lake. And uh, we've got a very good uh, system going here in Dodge County. We got a lot of meetings. Uh, Wayne was just up at our uh, at an event here in August with Wayne Fredericks. He did a really excellent job again. We've got good turnout. And uh, I think a lot of this has to do, we've got to educate the farmer. This has been our sixth year already. We do a lot of different events. I'm a fully no-till covers at Plant Green. I got a lot of projects going right now. I'm doing um, with Jim Sudi on covers and no covers and Pfeiffer interseeding for nitrogen use efficiency projects. It's been going now again with Discovery Farms. We got 60 inch corn, uh, working with Nature Conservancy now on another grant. So we're quite active here. We're doing a lot in our county, but um, it's a lot of it's got to be an education. We've got to get to these meetings. Farmers always got every excuse out there why this isn't working and why we can't, you know why it doesn't work and no, you can't do it, but we got to have that farmer support. 
these meetings, as Lauren knows too, we got a lot of different meetings I've been to, the farmers get together and talk, it's helping us a lot. But uh, with Jerry's uh, message, I think I hit, he hits it right on the head. I've seen that, I run the combine all the time. Lauren, you can probably interact too. Uh, where there's moisture this year, we had a drier year and our hills were excellent. I mean, and most farmers were complaining and they were all burned up. They had no yield on them. And, and uh, with the covers and uh, regenerative ag and getting our, our, our soil resiliency built up, it's been uh, really, you know, advantageous, really been a positive for this, uh, for, you know, using the water we've got out there and that. Our yields have been really doing good this year. Thank you, Tony. Um, while we're going around here, folks, again, feel free to uh, raise your hand or put a question in the chat. But I guess first we'll just continue to go around. Maybe uh, Lauren, do you, are you uh, at a point where you can speak up? Afternoon, everybody. Uh, I really wish this meeting could have been in this field I'm in right now. I'm I'm sitting in the middle of a field that uh, most people probably wouldn't think is possible in Iowa, but uh, we're I've been a lifelong farmer here. Uh, evolved through life, uh, was a livestock guy growing up, now straight grain due to some circumstances. Uh, last couple of years I've taken on a role with Dawn Equipment on the engineering team, trying to help design and build the equipment that uh, we see we need coming forth in the future. But uh, back to the field that I'm sitting in right now, you know, Jerry talked about the infiltration and all that stuff. If it wasn't for getting, making sure we can learn how to use every inch that we receive, probably would not be doing double crop in Northeast Iowa and stuff like that. You know, I, I heard Jerry say that Rick Clark hit 12, you know, 12 inches of infiltration. The field I'm sitting in right now when we did it this summer has over 20 inch infiltration, pretty easy. So, but uh, I tell everybody all day, it's, it's like I'm mowing a golf course right now. It's almost pretty, so. I don't know if they'll let me switch my camera around here, but I'll be around here trying to help out. So there you go. Great. I, don't know right, if, Seth. I don't know if the green shows up quite as good as it does here, but it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, Seth, let's let's hear from you. Hey, I just uh, real quick, I always appreciate what Jerry has to say. And I wish that uh, I wish his message could be adapted or adopted quicker. Um, it's sound, it's it's usable. Um, I guess I thought about a couple of things. For me, uh, one of the challenges we have with farmers is we do want to look at every piece of land the same with our farm bill and some of these issues. You know, i I'm not a I'm not a rocket scientist. I just uh, found that cows was the best way to use the kind of land I had, and unfortunately, and you know the the system we have is very much dominated by a, a farm bill that says, "Hey, we want you to uh, we want you to farm those hills." Is the message the the farmers get the thinner soil, some of these areas. Um, what's encouraging is the same things we're hearing about as we do apply covers, as we do understand how, you know, Jerry talked about genetics, our environment management, well, management is what you control, can control, but it's that, it's that knowledge of how three, all three work together to find the best fit. Um, that's when things really start to click. I was, my example would be just where we came in after we chopped silage, uh, the end of August, I went in and put a, a cover on a fall grazing cover for my cows to graze. Um, it didn't rain and it didn't rain and it didn't rain, but that field has been in no-till and in a, a, a about, 15, about 15 years. And what was amazing was everything started growing within three or four days with no rain. You know, that's a, that's a neat sight. And then when we did get the rains we needed, uh, I kicked the cows out on it yesterday and I've got tremendous forage. So, um, that's a real win for me as well. And, uh, I guess the other thing that kind of struck me, I really like looking at, at Wayne's pollinator strip habitat behind him. Um, <laughs> just for all of us to pause and remember that that's what made the soil we have and it took 10,000 years to do it. And uh, we've done a lot of damage in the last 170. And I guess I'm just reassured and, and have 
great hope when I see what happens when we start to apply some of the things we're talking about that we really can build it back. Um, I think that gives me more hope than anything else when I see that. All right, folks. Well, I know when we have our uh, leadership for Midwestern Watersheds meetings, we always get responses. Uh, let's have more farmer voices. In fact, when Wayne Frederick spoke in Cedar Rapids in 2019, Wayne, you, you got the highest uh, evaluation marks for, for your presentation among everybody. So uh, let's, uh, <laughs> I encourage our audience here to, to pitch your questions. You've got the farmers here doing the practices and right here in front of you. I might add to that really quick too. Tony talked about with his group, with the people at the lake and the involvement. I think this is the most important thing we can do with chambers, with economic development groups, whatever it is, invite farmers. Um, I think one of the, personally, I think one of the shortcomings in our industry is sometimes we've relied on our groups to speak for us and uh, it's okay to get out there and uh, get involved. And, and as farmers, we gotta have kind of thick skin too. We've gotta listen with an open ear and, and work toward solving the problem and, and explaining it as well. Yeah, like I say on the internet, that was uh, one of the big problems we had with the lake. We had three lakes in our county, and there was it was going to be lawsuits going on five years ago. We've broken that down, and we we invite them to some social events. We got pontoon rides with the farmers, and now they're supporting with their funding. Actually, there was a new uh, member, uh, a person moved into one of the lakes up there this year, and he donated another $500 to their uh, fund that they pay out farmers around the lake for to put covers on. They put out over 20,000 last year, just this one lake association. Instead of putting money in towards their lake or their fishing stuff, they're seeing the benefits of uh, farmers putting covers on, reducing the phosphorus and reducing the runoff into their lake. And they're willing to take the money from their pockets and put it to the farmers. So that's one of the big things we got. We got to get the, you know, the, the lake people involved and other farm, I don't know, not just farmers, but other uh, groups and people involved to help support the farmers in this movement. Uh, Lauren, we have a question. If you can just explain a little bit more what you were, what you've done in that field you're harvesting. Uh, is a practice where we plant the uh, CRI in the fall in the uh, precision matter, where next spring if we have a gap where we can come in and plant a soybean in there. Uh, 35 bushel and acre rye off of this field. And uh, 60 bushel and acre beans right now. So we, we've used, and I mean, that's essentially on four inches of water until most of that crop was mature this year. So I, I would say pretty much most of what we got this year came out of the reserves that we've built up into the soils. And uh, now this fall, we've got a good recharge. You know, this fall, for some reason, this field, uh, you know, volunteer cover crop is thrives pretty good. But uh, kind, of, kind of fun when you see this stuff. Does mm -hmm. that answer the question? Yeah, it was a little choppy at the beginning. We were talking about frost seeding rye, but uh, we got most of it there, I think. So, um, let me just throw out, like, I'll say, I mentioned this at the beginning of this hour, the, the survey we did of watershed coordinators. And, you know, I, I, one conclusion that's not so surprising is that people are more comfortable talking with these early adopter farmers, you know, and, and getting participation in their watershed efforts with folks who are kind of on the leading edge of these, of planting green and, you know, cover crops and no-till from before. Um, and I've met each of you at conferences, you know, that I go to for my job. Um, but it's a bigger struggle in watershed projects to kind of reach a larger mass of, of I, I mean, I know working through these farmer led groups is, is an obvious way to go. But any, any, any insight from any of you about how to get the messages we're talking about today, you know, maybe just um, how can watershed coordinators who might be employed by a conservation organization or a county or such, you know, do more to engage a, a, a larger uh, group of, of, of farmers. But that, that is a very good question. I've been dealing with that for a long time. We're trying to put events on, social events and other things uh, to maybe bring them in, you know, even though we're not strictly farming, but get them. I, I know some of the, we try to put four major events on a year in our county and some other ones. And uh, 
if you get some kind of new, something new out there that farmers are interested in and they have that person or have that piece of equipment at your field day and draw them in, try to draw the farmers that aren't maybe just, they don't want to come for soil health, but they may want to see this new, whatever it is, piece of equipment or new kind of practice out there and uh, get them there. And then we can start talking. It, it's just, it's going to be education. We got to keep educating these farmers. We got to get them to these meetings, you know, and, and explain our thing with Lauren and Jerry and Wayne, get them out and get them talking and, and we explain our stories, you know. I think one of the things we need more of is, uh, is demonstration. And, and I've, I've brought this up in the past, so I'll bring it up again because I don't think we're moving on it. But, you know, I'll use Iowa State as an example. Jerry's done great research up there. The professors have done great research that we apply. But to the best of my knowledge, I'd like to know of the other 14,000 acres of farmland that institution owns, how much of it will meet the nutrient reduction standard? How much of it has covers? How much is using no-till? How much is following the four R's? You know, um, we, we do believe in you and we follow what they do. So, you know, I get them great stuff from the professors and from the researchers, but when they don't take that research and apply it to their own land, it's really hard to get my print filled out. You know, and then the other question that I saw someone in the chat box was about asking their agronomist. And I'm, I, uh, you know, I miss good old fashioned extension where the agronomist didn't have any other agenda, but to help me make my farm better. Um, if you've got to sell something and move something forward, it, it's not their fault that they're trying to make a living, but sometimes you don't get all the information. And this goes back to how do we utilize our public resources for the public good? Seth and, and Tony and Lauren, uh, I mean, you've all, you've had great successes in what you've done. And I've, I've followed all of you uh, <laughs> along the way. And Lauren and I were having a LinkedIn com chat the other day about some of this, but uh, I think part of this, going back to your comment, uh, Seth, in terms of, of this and, and, and Wayne's comment is that I, I think there needs to be demonstrations that these practices are doable. They're, they're decreasing risk, not increasing risk. And I think a lot of producers look at anything like adding cover crops, particularly in, Tony in the upper in Wisconsin, things like that is too cold, it's too wet, we can never get yeah. it going. Uh, I mean, yeah. we got to get past these falsehood, the false statements that, uh, and all of this is, is out there. So uh, a preview of coming attractions, uh, Wayne and I are working on an article uh, about his data that's going to go into Crops and Soils magazine uh, to, to reach the, uh, the consulting agronomist. Uh, I've decided not to write it for the scientists because they probably wouldn't care. Uh, but uh, you know, I did wanted to get it into the, uh, the agronomist uh, the CCAs so that they could begin to see that, yeah, these things are real and uh, that there are these advantages. But also I think part of this, and there's a comment in the chat as well, and that's the, uh, I think, and it, I think it's spot on because I do believe that, that crop insurance uh, is, is one of our barriers to, to making change uh, in all of this because we've got that piece of it. Uh, Wayne can talk about the, the changes that he's done in his crop insurance program. Maybe Tony, you have too uh, with the, the changes that you've done. So Wayne, you might want to comment on what you've done with crop insurance over time. Oh, one thing that we've done is we've, over many, many years, we've always compared our yields to county yields, uh, and we put them out publicly. You know, we win some, we lose some, but, uh, you know, we're a really lean operation, you know, fertility-wise as well as, you know, being conservative as we are. Very low cost on equipment and labor and so forth, so we've got a lot of, a lot of positive benefits there. But looking at, you know, when you, when you go to buy crop insurance, you're making a bet against, uh, you know, you're either going to bet against yourself, or you're going to bet against the county. And uh, our yields have held up very well compared to the county. We chose to bet against the county, you took some of those county based products, uh, dramatically lower the cost of your crop insurance. But it's because you've got resiliency built into your fields. And, uh, and you can stand that change. And, and so that that's one thing that we've done that's been effective. Also want to respond to that crop insurance question from uh, 
uh, an ASA view. I sit on the American Soybean Association Board of Directors, and I'm also a uh, member of the GREE ET Coalition, which is uh, uh, based out of DC. And that group has been working hard and feverishly to, uh, to address the concerns about co uh, crop insurance and conservation practices. Uh, we firmly believe that farmers that uh, build more resiliency into their cropping system through the use of conservation practices, you know, warrant probably lower crop insurance rates. And so uh, I and others are working at the national level uh, to address that concern, because we definitely see that uh, in many cases, crop insurance encourages poor farming practices in areas where they shouldn't happen. And uh, those farmers that have built resiliency in the system uh, should be rewarded. Uh, there's a study being done right now by the University of Illinois, I think looking at the 2019 crop year and the effect that uh, uh, conservation and cover crops had on prevent plant acres. And uh, that should be coming forth here in near order, but uh, we sense that uh, those farms that had high amounts of cover uh, didn't have near the claims uh, for prevent plant that the, the conventional farms did. So just an example of, you know, groups of us that are working to make the situation better. Yeah, on, on our farm here, uh, we've never taken crop insurance out. I've, our farm has never ha ever taken crop insurance. So we our 1,100 acres were dairy. My dad was always against crop insurance. And with our resiliency we got in our, our land, even in 2019, most neighbors around my area had probably 50% pre -thent. We did that. We had 100% planted. I planted it later and it was a little, little wet, but we still got some pretty good yields off of it. I couldn't believe it, you know, so... Everybody's different, but I've we've never take crop insurance out yet on our farm. I think with the resiliency we got in our land, I've seen it out there and with the covers and that that and we do have a dairy, so some of that is salvageable for a dairy too always if you're straight crash grain. But but our farm may be an oddity, but I've never taken crop insurance out. I just yeah. Both the claims I've ever had have been on the market side or the price side instead of the, the actual crop loss. And I'm not a very good marketer, yeah. so that's been one one protection thing. We did, however, uh, face that on uh, once in a lifetime uh, Memorial weekend frost this year. You know, we had about 55% of our soybean acres that we replanted because of frost on our conservation acres. And uh, of course, crop insurance, you know, stepped in and, and facilitated on that, but no way that it covered the cost of the product, that's for sure, but it, uh, um, and it has, you know, you know, changed some of the conversation in this part again. So set us back a few years on some farmers that were on the edge. Uh, uh, one, one thing, and, and it was in the chat and somebody asked, you know, how do you get more uptake of these practices? I encourage all of you watershed coordinators, whenever you're, you're putting meetings together, to personally reach out to some of your larger conventional farmers in your area and give them a personal invitation. Eventually you might get one or two. And if we can ever make a change with the larger ones, it seems like the adoption curve changes rapidly in an area where they're farming because it's kind of like the good housekeeping stamp of approval if you can get one of your larger farmers to, to adopt some of these practices. And uh, so I, I would just really, really encourage you to continually extend those invitations to your larger conventional farmers to, to come to these soil health meetings. All right. <clears throat> I'm in a little better place now. I can give you a, a little better tutorial on relay cropping that I talked about. Here, here I'm standing now in a field that's set up for next year relay. I mean, you can, the biggest thing I want you to show is, you know, soybeans are traditionally hard on the soil structure of that that we heard him talk about. So there, there's on this side of the waterway. Now, this, next spring, I'll come in and plant the soybeans right here. And then across the waterway here. 
give me a quick exercise here. But uh, this is the field we're harvesting right now. There you can see what the soybean looks like now. The cereal rye was harvested last July. Uh, that's how we can infiltrate and use more water. So, sorry for a little diversion, but I usually like to have a little fun like that. <laughs> that's great, Lauren. I mean, we always want to do field trips uh, along with our meetings, so this is a impromptu way to do that. So it's perfect timing. <laughs> And we caught most of it. it. Chopped up a little at the end, but we got we got most of, of your of what you showed there. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and shift gears here. We're still gonna and, and if if the if if all of you uh, farmers can can stick around because we will ask you some Q and A, you know, or invite your thoughts after this next presentation as well. Um, but we're gonna shift now to that uh, sort of second half of the topic of ecosystem service markets and um, hear from American Farmland Trust. So we're going to hear from Jean Brokish. She's uh, go ahead, yep, and share your screen if you want, Jean. She's the Midwest Program Manager for American Farmland Trust. Um, so she provides coordination and support to the Illinois Sustainable Ag Partnership that some of you might be involved with, and also a couple of watershed projects: the Vermilion Headwaters Watershed Group and the Upper Macoupin Watershed Group, both in Illinois. Um, Dr. Emily Bruner, unfortunately, is not able to join us um, as planned today, but I know her. Her work is behind a lot of what you're presenting as well, Jean. So uh, take it away. Definitely. You can see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Craig said, I'm uh, Jean Brokish, the Midwest Program Manager for American Farmland Trust, um, which is a, a national nonprofit organization focused on preserving farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. Uh, I am based out of my home office near Champaign, Illinois, and my role with AFT um, focuses uh, uh, through my role, you know, I work with farmers in two high priority watersheds. So I'm, I'm right there with all the other watershed uh, professionals and watershed planners on this call. And then I also uh, provide the coordination for the Illinois Sustainable Ag Partnership. And um, over the past year, I've worked alongside my colleague, Dr. Emily Bruner, um, in the whole space of ecosystem markets, really, we've developed a number of materials for farmers and uh, farm advisors with the goal of increasing transparency and helping farmers evaluate and, and understand this rapidly evolving world and landscape of ecosystem markets. Um, before I start, um, I'd like to really get a sense of current knowledge and experience of farmer markets uh, with carbon markets of people on the call. So there's a short poll. I'll ask um, Craig or Lena if you can post that. Um, we can. It'll be helpful for me just to kind of get a baseline knowledge of where people are with knowledge, um, experience. Have farmers or landowners in your network asked you about ecosystem markets? I'm not sure how many total are on the call. Um, Craig, when you feel it's done, we can go ahead and share this, but it looks like probably somewhere around 70 per, 60 to 70 percent or so are, yes, you've had some, somebody has asked you about this. So definitely farmers are interested in uh, knowing more. And um, really one of the goals we wanna do, I don't have a ton of time, so I'm just covering some basic concepts and some key resources to you, but hopefully this presentation will give you um, more confidence and some information to help answer some questions or direct farmers to the information that is helpful to them. So first let's start with just some background. What are ecosystem markets? Um, in a nutshell, it's really an exchange between an entity that produces greenhouse gas um, and one that reduces greenhouse gas. So that is the credit. Uh, so if we walk, um, I keep uh, getting, my poll keeps popping up here. So excuse me if I have to minimize that. Um, the background, so basically the payments are generated in order to protect or restore or mitigate some sort of impact to the ecosystem. And those um, activities, what we're doing, we're, we're mitigating those impacts by way of conservation practices. Um, those practices are often part of a traditional state or federal incentive program. Um, and the payments are generated based on outcomes verified at the field level. So this is where one nuance difference between the marketplace and like equip 
cost share. Um, you're not being paid necessarily because you planted a cover crop, you're being paid for the carbon that is sequestered because of that practice. So it's an outcome-based practice. And those are outcome-based payments. And though markets exist currently for carbon sequestration, um, other greenhouse gas reductions, as well as water quality, there's some discussion on habitat or biodiversity um, markets as well. Um, in terms of uh, greenhouse gases, you know, they're produced in multiple sectors. We have uh, transportation industry, agriculture, they're all uh, producing different levels of greenhouse gases. And so this slide just really provides some context for the agricultural greenhouse gases. And uh, looking at, you know, if you look along the production pathway, there's pre-production. Uh, this includes inputs like seed and fertilizer. And there's post-production, including things like processing, storing the product, et cetera. Um, focusing on the center, you know, really focusing on the agricultural uh, on farm management, both mechanical and non mechanical, you know, these are things like reducing the number of field operations, tweaking our nutrient management, increasing soil organic carbon, etc. These practices are immediately available um, and are really the focus of a lot of market discussion right now because it takes a little bit more time to get the technology to reduce fuel and to improve cooking and retail and all that stuff but we know how to reduce field operations. We know how to tweak our management of nutrients and soil organic carbon. And really by focusing on the center on this on-farm management piece, we can start addressing carbon and greenhouse gases and create some of the co-benefits that Jerry talked about. Um, and so here again, another context about kind of whether Jerry discussed some of the changing climate issues. Um, these dots represent multiple um, environmental, weather, climate-related disasters. Um, and so practices like cover crops, no-till, um, can, can help improve resiliency by improving the soil health, right? So this is an important point to emphasize when we're talking with farmers. I don't believe most farmers are that motivated by some corporations' greenhouse gas targets but they are motivated by the ability and how often and when they can plant and their yield and stuff like that. So if we think about this from a resiliency perspective and the ability of a farm to weather those literal storms and climate related disasters, I feel like that's an important context um, as we're thinking about carbon markets and the whole carbon uh, and co-benefits that come with those practices. So um, just, but just kind of looking at the market, what's driving the demand? Um, consumer demand and corporate responsibility have really motivated many national and international corporations to set these voluntary targets. And so they're, they're building these science-based strategies um, to achieve these environmental outcomes. And, and on the left of this graphic, it shows the supply chain. Um, and then on the right are some of the players in that phase. So if we look at the top, you know, we have the actual production of the agricultural materials. Those and the players in that are the pr primary producers are the farmers. Um, then we have the processing transportation, the distribution part of it. So we have our, our millers, our processors for meat and dairy, and uh, then manufacturing. These are uh, the consumer packaged goods, this is the PepsiCo, the General Mills, the Kellogg Corporation that have these targets. And uh, this, this row is where we've seen the majority of the growth in demand uh, for markets. So from 2019 to 2020, corporations represented 96% of the rise in voluntary market transactions. And it was led again by these consumer good companies, financial institutions and energy industries. And um, Below that line, um, you know, the last stage in that is the retailer. That, that's me when I go and eat my bag of Doritos, you know, or I go to the restaurant. Um, so as a product moves through the supply chain, there are multiple points where greenhouse gases may be produced or corresponding opportunities to reduce it. And so this line kind of shows, you know, the upstream portion of it above that line, 80% of the carbon footprint of a product is generated upstream. And so the so the corporations be, before it gets to the before it gets to the point of sale. So the corporations 
are finding really that the most effective and cost efficient opportunities are, are higher in the watershed. Just like as we work in the watershed restoration, most often if we can if we can address the problem high up in the watershed at its source, it's the most cost effective way to do it. And it's the exact same way with this carbon market um, as it moves through the supply chain. So again, they are looking at these on-farm carbon storage opportunities through things like cover crops and no-till and opportunities to reduce those agricultural inputs. So um, it's, it's, it's sort of shovel ready. You know, agriculture is getting a lot of attention right now because it is a great opportunity, but it's also easily implemented at the farm scale. Um, and here, again, we kind of like have this graphic of, of what a carbon credit might look like. And this is pretty simplified, but essentially <clears throat> we have this company that sets a climate target they go down through the arrow, have they cut enough carbon themselves? Yes, if they did, they're done. You know, they met their goal. If not, they need to come over here into this market space and they're getting it. The markets are being uh, generated. The other half of the market space is the project developer and the projects itself. And so this is um, where we can plant our trees, where we can capture carbon in the soil. Um, by either removing carbing or avoiding emissions, we can get this you know, center market space and it, it generates a financial uh, trade. Money's actually moving from the, the industry into the project developer. So for, for the market to really work, we need a measurable reduction or avoidance of greenhouse gas. Uh, we need um, markets are created and or, or traded equivalent to one metric ton of of CO2E, so that's carbon dioxide equivalent. So that includes carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. That's the unit that the market operates in. And uh, it's traded either via compliance or a voluntary market. Um, so we can have carbon and other greenhouse gases moving through this market space um, based on those different parameters there. And so, so again, just underscoring the fact that corporations are looking at agriculture because it's cost effective and readily implemented. And this figure just provides an overview of the national coverage of, of acres where changes to soil management practices could be applied. It provides context for the scale of opportunity. You know, in total, there are 400 million acres of cropland in the US where these practices could be implemented. Um, so if we can build soil health, we can transition these lands potentially from a net source greenhouse gas uh, emissions to a potential sink for those greenhouse gases. That, so everybody wants to know how many credits can my farm generate or can a farm generate? And, and it is a resounding large, it depends. Uh, that is like the best possible answer. Um, the table depicts ranges of greenhouse gas reduction potential across multiple soils and geographies. And the range is, is so wide because it depends so much on climate, soil type, um, what, what practice is being used, some of the nuances of the practices that I'll get into here just a second. Um, and, and so, you know, you look at cover crops, the range is 0.16 to 0.77 metric tons per acre per year. And no-till is 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 um, um, metric tons per acre per year. And, and if you were to combine them, you know, doing both practices in combination, you're somewhere around a ton of carbon that can be uh, market ready per acre per year you're generating there. Um, so there's, there's general consensus, even though there's a range, there's really is general consensus around this. And um, based on modeling and um, studies and field verifications that are underway. And this uh, map just has kind of a visual depiction of the greenhouse gas reduction potential through the adoption of cover crops. So these are state weighted averages based on the use of Comet Planner, and the values are scaled. Um, you know, they're, they're based on counties with cropland and what's the potential in that county and then averaged across the whole state. And so they're really just intended for comparative purposes only, but it really illustrates the variability and dependence on things like climate, topography, soil type, et cetera. And, um, you know, for cover crops, if you're in the Midwest or the South, um, you're pretty good. But if you're in the Pacific Northwest, you know, maybe not so much potential there. 
and even within even within like say the state of of Illinois um, at 0.49, your farm's potential will be further dependent on um, you know the number of sequential years that you are cover cropping. You know how long the cover crop is actually grown before it's terminated, what species you're being used, and and by far the uh, largest soil organic carbon increases for cover crops are associated with temperate locations, fine texture soils, and mixed species of those cover crops. So those are just some general rules of thumb um, for potential there. Similarly, we have a, a map depicting the potential for no-till. Um, same state weighted averages and process used to come up with those numbers. Um, and, and again, you know, looking at the Midwest, the I states um, are, are sitting pretty good for potential through no-till or strip-till. And um, a lot of this, you know, farm to farm variation would depend obviously on soil type, but also on depth of previous tillage practices. And um, you get the best increases with those temperate locations in well-drained soils. <clears throat> so, you know, there's there's general consensus and there's definitely a large opportunity for this potential uh, for agriculture to reduce greenhouse gases. And, and I believe it's really safe to say that the market opportunity is here to stay and will, it will continue to evolve though. You know, there's a lot of work left to do in terms of verifying credit and uh, uh, some risk associated from the market perspective or market standpoint in terms of how much credit and how, can actually be generated and how much is it actually worth. And so there's kind of four criteria or approaches that are being um, developed right now and are important to understand. Um, the first is additionality. This is the requirement that markets are paying for only new practices. This I recognize wholeheartedly, this is the biggest rub among farmers who've been doing these practices for a long time. Um, but at this time, the voluntary market is requiring practices um, to be different than business as usual. So if you've been doing this and um, your neighbor hasn't been doing this and he starts doing cover crops and he would be eligible for the marketplace and you would not. It's, it's an unfairness, but it's how the market is right now at this point in time. Um, the permanence thing, this is depending on the protocol, practices need to be maintained for 10, 20, or even up to 100 years. And as you're thinking about permanence, um, you also think about contract length and penalties. Um, there's also in the permanence bucket is these buffer pools that are being established. And this is um, sort of like a savings account that these companies are creating to offset any unplanned losses. So for example, if a farmer's being paid based on the carbon captured through no-till and then one year tillage is needed for whatever reason. You know, companies are reserving some of the credits to be used for that situation, just like a savings account would be. Uh, leakage refers to accounting for the full effects. So for example, um, if you're implementing a cover crop but it's actually requiring more fuel to do that, are we taking the whole, um, balance sheet of inputs and outputs into account there. And verification, um, multiple approaches are being developed and tested and tweaked here. You know, some companies are using remote sensing and modeling, some companies are using soil sampling, some companies, all the companies are relying on farmer records and receipts and documentation. So it's really, really important, um, unless you're really enthusiastic about record keeping, or, or be aware and be prepared for the record keeping requirement for these markets. <clears throat> and so, you know, we know there are multiple opportunities and different approaches. So there's really no surprise that there's a lot of different entities playing in the carbon market sandbox right now. And so I have a few slides just walking through some different approaches, but before I do that, I just really wanna kind of put some caveats out there that this is, continues to be a rapidly changing landscape. Many of these companies um, are still in pilot phase or, or they're doing three or four different pilot phases and they're trying to figure out what a full rollout is or they're doing staged rollouts. And then new partnerships are forming all the time. So some of the information, and I know this is, this is dense slide. Um, we have a resource document that summarizes this information for you that um, I'll be sure to post the link in the chat uh, when I wrap up. But 
essentially, um, you know, they're, they're very, they're somewhat similar. So this bucket just shows some of the market entities. These are essentially the brokers or the matchmakers between the farmers generating the carbon and the corporations willing to pay. Um, the, the second bucket that I have is input providers. And, and these buckets uh, were just created by Emily and I um, when we first started this work. And it was really more just to help us kind of think about the different approaches. Um, so this slide lists some of the entities that we labeled input providers. These are um, entities that farmers are likely familiar with. You know, you're buying your seed or your fertilizer from them. Some of them are offering cash incentives. Some of them are offering discounts or almost like coupons for future product purchases. And then the last bucket is uh, data platforms. These are sort of a hybrid between the two previous buckets. Um, they're using data and technology um, to engage with farmers and connect them to the incentives. So um, again, rapidly changing landscape, um, rapidly evolving programs and the new partnerships are forming. And, and I know you couldn't read all the information, but I am gonna just run through these slides quick again and just highlight some of the values on here, which will be outdated by the time this webinar is done, I'm sure. But, um, you know, Nori, here we have $7.50 per acre average. We have about $15 per ton. So if you do both practices, that's about $15 per acre. Here, uh, $25 per acre was the incentive rate. And uh, this last one, um, ESMC varies. It's, it, they don't, we don't have a, a standard number for them. Um, Bear is somewhere between $3 and $6 per acre or $9 if you adopt both practices. Uh, here's about $15 per acre credit minimum payment, and then there's about $20 per acre. Um, pilot is $20 per credit, um, $20 per credit there, and $20 per credit there. So somewhere around $15 to $20 per acre is what the majority of farmers could expect to get by playing in a marketplace. And for the majority of farmers, I would say that this is not enough to drive practice adoption based solely on the financial incentive. So um, if we think about this, and as you engage farmers, you know, the first question I think that really needs to be asked is, is the farmer committed to improving soil health or solely motivated by that financial incentive? If the latter, you know, I think it's really important to be realistic and recognize, again, that current payments may not be enough at this point in time. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that market participation will require management changes. It goes back to that additionality piece and technical support. And, you know, these two boxes are true, whether you're doing these practices just for the marketplace or whether you're doing it solely for soil health or whether you're doing it for both of them. You know? So um, those three boxes, it's important to be realistic, acknowledge the management and the technical support needs. But what's really different is the records. So market participation requires time to get the records and also consider the time needed to retain those records. Um, are, do you need to retain those records for seven years, like your taxes, you know, or 15 years or until you die, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, Jerry actually asked this question. I thought it was really good. He asked us to consider what is the value of carbon? And um, if you don't believe me yet, I, you know, <laughs> I feel like, you know, the marketplace alone doesn't really value carbon at a level that makes sense for a farmer. However, if we are valuing carbon through the lens of improved soil health, which leads to better water quality and, and really supports more resilient and profitable farms, I think we start, I think we start putting a more realistic and um, true value on these practices and the carbon they're creating for us. So um, to help just kind of bring this full circle and why we started playing in this whole game to start with in terms of, of um, you know, providing that transparency and helping farmers navigate the space. There's some resources to help you. Um, there's a, a two page summary of AFT's combating climate change on US cropland and the full report is available on our website there. And I, and I, can, I can post these links in the chat when I'm done. Um, and then also on the right, um, the Illinois Sustainable Ag Partnership has um, 
developed multiple tables summarizing these different uh, programs, as well as um, on our website are recordings of um, eight hours worth of webinar content, which includes the 12 market opportunities I just recapped and one farmer's perspective as well. You can access those. And then even more resources to help you uh, include the National Sustainable Ag Coalition, which follows legislative developments. This is a really good place to go to see what current proposed bills or budgets are on the table. Um, and then there are multiple documents listing questions and considerations for farmers. And so like there's a link to a document from FarmDoc, which is at the which is out of the University of Illinois. And um, I just encourage you too to, to stay tuned because Emily and I continue to work through ISAP and we'll be expanding and updating resources on ISAP's website over the winter months, um, including ultimately developing some sort of slide deck and resource document that would be available to uh, watershed planners, watershed groups, those chambers of commerce who are interested in learning more as well, um, you know, CCA advisors, whatever. We really want to. Um, in, engage professionals and provide information for them to help inform farmers. Um, lots of times we get on a um, presentation from one of these entities and it's just a, car, a commercial about their program. And so we're really just trying to provide some transparency and generate some information that will help people evaluate the opportunities. And so gratitude to my colleague, Emily, um, and to American Farmland Trust in Illinois Sustainable Ag Partnership, and of course, Thanks to Craig and the San County Foundation for inviting us to be part of this conversation. And with that, I will stop sharing. And I think we have some questions. Um, or, if, or I'm interested to hear from the farmers too, what their perspectives are, if they've looked at these uh, market opportunities too. Yeah, thanks, Jean. Let's go ahead and uh, we're we're getting a question or two in the chat, and we welcome more. But um, let's let's hear from Tony, Lauren, um, Seth, or Wayne. Just kind of maybe two parts. I mean, you're probably early adopters who face that additionality unfairness if you've already adopted these practices. But also, you know, what do you see as the opportunity just in the in the broader landscape? Um, you've been watching these markets emerge for a year or two or more. What, what are your thoughts? I have a concern, um, being an early adopter and also 70 years old and gonna rent farmland out in the near future. Uh, have we disincentivized uh, my farmland in the rental market because uh, a new young renter could not take part in these carbon markets? So, so um, someone who's renting your land and and um, wouldn't be eligible because they couldn't add new practices, you mean? Already everything's been done, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, potentially, you know, I, I hadn't thought about it. Usually the question comes up about whether, whether rented lands would be eligible for these programs. And um, that answer, of course, is it depends. I mean, generally, yes, but it requires commitment from both the producer and the landowner, just like any other incentive. Um, often does. Um, but yeah, I mean, potentially, you know, someone who's someone who's in the market space, you know, as you're looking for prospective tenants and lessees, someone who's in in the market space may not want to rent your land because they would not be able to realize that additional income through the market for practices. So that gives you the concern about permanence. How many early adopters will finally let that ground be uh, disturbed to uh, more competitively put that ground back into a, a land market. Um, there's a whole lot of them that started the same time I did. We're all facing retirement with, you know, non-family members taking over. It's it's kind of concerning what what's happening. We got a real disincentive up here for con ground that's in conservation based on carbon market opportunities um, and even CSP opportunities can't get in that program anymore either. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it creates quite an interesting conversation. So you have to sell solely on the benefits that, you know, about the resiliency and the profitability and so forth within the land itself and ignore 
the opportunities of the carbon markets because in reality, we don't have them. I think, I think Wayne kind of said it very well. That's been my experience also is that uh, I was really excited when I first got approached about carbon markets, but you know, I'm primarily a, a grass farmer and we have cattle, but I was saying, you know, like this hillside, I always wanted to plant more trees on it. And I'd like to expand my wetland over here and that would give me the money to do it. And they said, well, you know, that's, that's really not part of our plan, but we'd like to sell you some seed treatment and some marketing options. And then we'll work with you on what you can do for carbon. And, you know, it was kind of like a, 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 I won't say a kick somewhere um, was what it felt like. And uh, it soured me on it, to be honest. Yeah, I agree the same thing too. It kind of started me because we've been doing the practices. Now I don't qualify for that. And I, I told him, you know, with Indigo, I've been back and forth that, you know, it's not, it's nothing for me in there because I've been doing the practice so long. So I don't know. It's that same old thing, you know, with the farm bill part of it too. I mean, I'm looking out here saying, gosh, instead of giving someone a, a $20 an acre subsidy to buy crop insurance, why don't you just give me 20 bucks an acre not to farm it? and graze it and see what I can do or, or just keep the money and give it to someone who really needs it. What's happening is you're disincentivizing all of your teachers for the next generation of farmers that need to learn about how to do this. Are you alienated? Let's put it this way. Uh, those of us that have, have learned the ropes and you're asking us to teach the next set of farmers how to adopt so they can qualify for benefits that we can't get. I don't disagree with anything you're saying, and, and I'm not a market advocate. So let me just be honest about that too. Um, lots of times I've given this presentation before where, you know, I have a slide that says which, which market is right for me. And, and I, the response is oftentimes none. You know, uh, and, and like for farms interested in um, implementing some practices, sometimes the more traditional cost share rates are actually better. Um, you know, I said kind of recapped somewhere in a ballpark of $15 per acre. That's, that's not enough to incentivize a practice change. Um, and, you know, cover crop payment through EQIP is sometimes double or triple or quadruple that, you know, so it's, it's um, I agree that it's not all that it was kind of initially, um, promoted or sometimes and continues to be promoted to be question i always try to ask folks when they're considering it is if if we go to uh, the, the pendulum swings and we go to a tax program versus an incentive where are you going to sit at that point if you've sold all your carbon credit they're not going to sell them back to you the same price you sold them for um, well, that's true. And I think I've heard too, you know, people have described this as kind of the wild west. I, I think um, I, my hope is that over time, some of these unfairness um, and, and wild things, you know, will, will settle down and be resolved. And um, I, you know, I know one time there was some, some discussion about the carbon bank, you know, and there was hope that that would address some of the early adopter additionality concerns. Um, who knows where where that's going to land, or what the next version of sausage will look like coming from public programs? You know, um, there there is a question in the chat. Someone asked, "Can you can you get equip and carbon payments on the same acres?" And um, the answer generally is that you can stack private and public dollars together. So public dollars through EQIP because you're being paid for the practice and private dollars through the market incentives because you're being paid on the carbon. So those two, it is possible to stack them. Um, you cannot stack two private entities together, two private programs together. And a lot of that, again, it just comes down to the fine print and knowing and understanding what happens to that carbon credit as it moves through the marketplace. Um, and then even, you know, from a, um, from a, a, a public USDA incentive based uh, thing, are you being paid for the practice or are you being paid for the outcome? If you're being paid for the outcome, then you can't get additional funds for the outcome. So um, it's really messy. And, and it's like, 
rapidly evolving and and really Emily has been um, Emily has been paying, staying up late at night reading all of the latest reports and documents and keeping track of some of the moving parts and all these nuances. Um, I wish she were here because she'd probably have some good uh, insights and responses to share with you all too on some of these challenges. One thing I've always struggled with a little bit is I'm, it's still fuzzy. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of the practices I do and I can show people how no-till, how extended my grazing seasons, how those practices have reduced my costs. And I can show people I've expanded my soil organic matter, but I'm still not sure if I'm carbon neutral in my own operation and I'm turning around and selling someone else a credit. It, it seems a little fishy to me. Um, you know, I think it's a really interesting question, you know, and so um, I know there are some farms, the, the farmer that we had on our webinar in July um, is a rice farmer from Arkansas and he actually created his own app and balance sheet to figure out if he was carbon neutral or not and he actually has decided that and he's he's at a scale and a place where he can actually do this but he's actually owning his credits all the way through he's growing the rice he's packaging the rice he's marketing it and he's reporting those credits at the end so um you know, it, it might be worth reaching out to him. I'd be happy to, to connect you or, or, or um, see if he's willing to talk with others about it, you know, because I think he has kind of an accounting system that has helped him figure out if he is carbon neutral or not. But definitely you can imagine how many pieces go into that, right? You know, the, the tractor and the seed, the pre-production and post-production wings that we talked about. I'll pass on a chat question about um modeling, predicting carbon storage in soils, the variability between what's predicted in models versus what might actually be measurable. Um, is there some standardization to be expected uh, in, the, in the modeling, in the prediction of soil carbon accumulation that could help standardize that? I think over time that will come. Um, I think there's so many variables in soil right now and from region to region. So I think it, it will take some time to dial those models in a little bit more. And then, um, you know, back what Seth was saying, they're also looking at models for rotational grazing or managed grazing as well, you know, kind of integrating and looking at additional cropping cycles too. Um, but uh, at this point, right, it's, it's, it's pretty fuzzy, I agree. Greg, could I uh, let me chime in a, a little bit on that to amplify Gene's point? And I think part of this between uh, modeling and and the soil. I mean, you start looking at at uh, soil samples across the field, and you look at uh, uh, how we sample the upper foot or or six inches of that soil, which is often where the carbon measurements are made. Uh, there's just so much variability that we get within <laughs> sampling from spot to spot. You can pick a high spot, you can pick a low spot. And I think a lot of this in terms of the models is that the models are doing a very poor job of predicting how much uh, crop is really growing there. So we don't even know the inputs uh, going in and then uh, understanding how much goes out when we do each tillage operation or we do each piece of the puzzle. So I think we've got a lot of work to do in just understanding how carbon gets into the soil and, and how it relates to all the different management practices and the crop that we're growing at times. So uh, it just adds another piece to the wild, wild west that uh, uh, Gene talked about in terms of the carbon markets. It's the wild, wild west and, and being able to understand just a lot of the interactions that are going on. But we'll get it resolved eventually. We just got to figure out <laughs> how some of these things interact. And, and I think just in all honesty, recognizing that there's gonna be some winners or lose, and losers yeah. along the way. Um, there's some good, some good chat here, the field yeah. print calculator um, developed by Field to Market um, was offered up as an example that could help you uh, figure out your environmental impact. So that might be something. Um, and I, I know I said I was gonna post some uh, links. I, I'd have to go through my PowerPoint. Maybe Craig afterwards, could I get the links to you and then you could send them out by email afterwards instead of me trying to multitask here and get those? Sure. Okay, thank you. Yep, okay. 
and you'll have a lot of those updated over time on the ISAP website as well, right? So. Yeah, yeah. The um, the the URL for ISAP, which I have memorized, and I can put in the chat here in a second, um, will stay, and that's where we have a lot of um, existing materials, and we'll continue to post our materials there. So that I can do. Okay. Put that in here. Um, here's a question. It was aimed to the farmers. Um, it says like about how many years of financial incentives are useful to get through a transition? You know, you've all done a transition of sorts and just, you know, no-till and whatnot um, until it's kind of recovered its profitability and, and would take over. And, you know, it's a short time investment, hopefully of a few years. And, and this may be carbon markets or just even uh, general soil health transitions. What, what would be the amount of time that is really necessary? If, where 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 a financial assistance can help. Well, I get kicked off if I say zero. <laughs> no, you can I, say I that. At, I was at a conversation this morning. They're talking about the upcoming uh, potential payments and that from current administration and that. And, you know, it goes back to rewarding those who have pioneered it. They've done it without much incentive. I mean, you know, how, how do you make it fair for them? You know, yes, I, I I like incentives all as much as anybody, but he said, how long before you break the treadmill? And, uh, you know, let, let's focus on figuring out how to make it cash flow in the first place. You know, that's what's led up for us. And, uh, and let's focus on feasibility all. I, I, I guess I'll comment. Um, I gen generally got into things before um, I, I, I took the incentive and after then you'd already been doing it so you don't qualify anymore. So we've had over the period of time have had very little financial incentive, a little bit lately here I help with cover crops. I think that's probably where it's most effective is on the cover crop side. The adoption of no-till and strip tiller such a huge financial benefit to the farmer when you when you get away from all that equipment and, and labor and, and fuel and stuff that goes with intensive tillage uh, that should be a no-brainer it's just that it's, it's just hard to get farmers to 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 uh, give up that tillage and uh, that that's the biggest obstacle we have to overcome in my part of the world uh, before we even talk about cover crops is is how do we get them to, to uh, reduce their amount of tillage? Um, strip till is a good route. That's a good way to help in this heavy soils. Uh, but man, we've, we're gaining, but it's not near fast enough. But, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure on the dollars. I think this again comes back to the, the need for sizable demonstration farms. It's the learning curve that I needed the help with. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm not a grain farmer first. I'm a cow farmer first and a grain farmer second. And seeing those things, seeing the application, and I could have saved myself a couple of years of frustration maybe uh, if I had more resources to see. I often said that a farmer has to go to a cover crop school before he does cover crops or go to a no-till school before he does no-till <laughs> because it's the ones that go out and do it wrong that end up becoming the, the the token farmer in the coffee shop that naysays the practice and it takes us five more years to overcome that that one incidence yeah Um, hey, I want to, we, we have a post event evaluation and we invite folks to please stay on. We're going to continue with a few more questions, but Lena, if you can post the evaluation uh, questions and folks, this, this helps with uh, all of us and our partners in terms of reporting and, and funding and so forth. So if, if, uh, if you're willing to answer these simple poll questions um, before anyone jumps off, uh, we'll be putting them up in the next right now here. And while, while people answer that poll, um, oh, there's actually a few questions. Maybe I'll just be quiet and let people focus on the focus on the answers.
Is there, um, oh, oh, I see. There's actually multiple different questions. So yeah. we'll go through this. Um, while we're doing that, there is a question just from the farmers to talk about the things they needed to learn. So maybe, uh, you know, I'd be interested in kind of hearing from them the two or three, uh, two or three points um, can be thinking about that. And as we get through these poll questions, um, we can get your insights in what things you would have learned at cover, would have liked to learn at cover crop school or no-till school. Well, one thing I started uh, with covers over 20 some years ago in a watershed at that time, there really was nothing out there for covers. And we were, there was no really answer what to use for a cover. We started out with some oats and some barley and then got into rye and we saw rye was more beneficial, but that was over 20 some years ago. And I think it would be beneficial. And we try to help out in our, our group here in Dodge County to farmers and help them. We've got the contacts they can contact to help them get to figure out what kind of covers they need to put in. But it is true. They knew, you don't need to understand what kind of covers you got out there, how to terminate them, when to turn it, terminate them and how to use them. And, uh, back, you know, some 20 years ago when I got started, it was just like throwing throwing it up in the air and see what happens, you know, and hit it against the wall. So uh, it'll help a lot of farmers go forward a lot faster if we can get this education and get the support out to them for the covers. Yeah, yeah I might add, I guess I kept thinking, I know we're here to talk about carbon markets and some of the other questions, but since I'm talking to watershed coordinators, um, that good old fashioned learning by doing also where you can put a group of farmers together in a tributary or a, you have better names for a, you know, just even a small stream running to a, to a, to a river. Um, there's, I've seen some cases where you kind of get some friendly competition and maybe a little bit of a nudge on, on people. And I know it's a small place to start, but I think it's a great way to bring people together to learn and see those things and maybe get more than one person at a time adapting. You probably have a name for it, so. Well, that's what's good about here in Wisconsin. Like you say, our dad cap is supporting us uh, wholeheartedly now. We've got a million dollars that'll go mm -hmm. out as grant money to our, our farmer-led groups in Wisconsin. We're getting close to 40 farmer-led groups going now in these last uh, years. So uh, it's been pretty beneficial having farmer led groups and uh, getting them out there and supporting the farmers. I've got this chance this year at the national no-till conference with Greg Olson <laughs> and Dana Crystal from DadCap. We're gonna put on an hour session out there at the uh, national no-till conference on how to start farmer led groups and benefits of them and how to get grants and that. So uh, I think it's a very important thing out there to uh, have these farmer led groups. And it seems that's the way you can get farmers to talk and work together and uh, it's a very important key uh, thing going forward. How, I guess I'm kind of asking the group this, how big of a challenge is it that Iowa set up with 99 conservation districts instead of structured more in watershed districts? That's an interesting question. We may need to add some time onto the uh, onto the event to dig into it. But uh, it seems like a leverage point in shifting this thing. You know, I mean, I'm I I'm not that big of a farmer, but I farm in three counties because of where I live, and every every office is different. Mm -hmm. In Mitchell County, we had in Rock Creek watershed. That was the first watershed in Iowa that adopted the nutrient reduction strategy following the Iowa plan. Um, and we've had a watershed coordinator. We've had a farmer advisory committee uh, that's been pretty active. Mm -hmm. And in, in, yeah, we're over 20% now cover crops in our watershed. Uh, that definitely is way, way, way above anything that's happening uh, across state for an average. I, not to say there aren't some other watersheds that are close, but uh, those watershed groups, if you got farmers engaged or part of, especially if they're part of the writing of the watershed plan um, are a lot more successful than um, non-active watersheds. And, and we find out that our, our little watershed group does way more than our whole county does. And, and somewhat they're almost the envy of our, our county commissioners in some respect. So um, they, uh, they're powerful. Um, 
don't think they're not. We just, mm -hmm. we have so many watersheds in the state. How you, we just, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to have watershed coordinators that have the ability to manage more than one watershed. That's for sure. And I think that's doable. I really do. Well, it's three o'clock. Uh, I just want to close with one thought, uh, keeping this with watershed projects and coordinators, you know, a successful watershed project has a lot of assets. It has a watershed plan. It has an inventory of how many acres of what types of soils and what's, what are rates of adoption. And they have social, uh, you know, assets in, in terms of farmer led groups and a coordinator and, and, and trust built between partners. It just seems like they're already pursuing these and quantifying to some degree the actions taken for uh, water quality. And could that, could those not be also given credit for um, carbon sequestration and other markets without necessarily having to measure every last acre individually with contracts with individual farmers? I just throw that thought out there and Gene, I don't know, maybe someday there'll be a point where markets would invest in a watershed, you know? Um, as an investment opportunity, much like in Wisconsin, we have a producer-led program from the ag department of the state that produces, that supports groups like Tony's. Um, and then they can apply the funds as they, as they see best with their own incentive programs or education or so forth. But anyway, that's my, that's my last thought. Um, okay, thank you very much everybody for, for joining. Uh, thanks for everyone for sticking through for two hours, especially Tony and Lauren and Seth and Wayne uh, as well. I'm really glad you registered and became part of the, the discussion. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Gene. And uh, hey, keep an eye on your email for hopefully we can see many of you in person in February in Prairie du Chien. And if you didn't get an email about this particular event we're on now, then go to our website, uh, St. County Foundation's uh, Leadership for Midwestern Watersheds, and uh, put your name in so you'll be on the email list as well. All right. Also if anybody wants to get in contact with me or our group or we're on the website or contact me in person and I can help them out with their getting these groups started because Jerry you've been to one of our sessions years back uh, Wayne you just came in August and uh, everybody's pretty impressed at what we can do we got to get these farmers together and we got to educate education is going to be the key moving forward yep yep all right. Well, we'll keep plugging away with our watershed uh, network in, in that way as well. So um, thanks again. And we'll, uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. We'll see.